Hi my loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing my September books video for you all. Um, I looked at this pile and thought I swear I read more this month but then I realised I sort of cheated on my August books because I was so deeply in my slump and I had a couple of books I really wanted to finish up before I talked to you about them um, that I ended up reading those books into September. So I did in fact read more that is than is in this pile. It's still you know it's not too bad. This is what we're working with today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I had it in my mind that I'd read more, but anywho, so most of these books are on the Booker long list. As you know, I am attempting to read all of them before um, the winner is announced. So yes, that's what we're kind of focusing on today. But in my October books, as you will also know, if you watch my October TBR, we are doing a whole new thing. We're doing kind of seasonal reading and it's going to be really fun so if you're sick of me talking about the booker because i kind of am um then that's okay because next month's book video will be back to sort of a big range of books well actually they're all about haunted houses but um back to a bit more of a range of books that aren't currently all up in the news um so yes also can i just take a minute to apologize for the lighting we have to have the overhead lights on today because it is so gloomy outside. Not that I'm really complaining because I'm kind of enjoying it, but um, yes, I'm sorry, we have to have the overhead lights on today. But let's get on to October's book club picks. I picked a couple from my existing TBR. I did not really think about book club when I was making my TBR. I just popped a whole load of books on there that I really wanted to read myself. Um, so yes, I picked two because I feel like Lots of you have read one of them and that might be a good thing because it might mean that you can participate in the discussions um, but also you might want to read something that you haven't read before so also pick this other one um, which I think fewer people have read. Still lots of people have read it but fewer of you have read it so yes and also anyway <laughs> let me show you them. I haven't picked non-fiction for this month by the way. Um, I'm sure I will get back into that uh, November but I thought for this month we just go with two fictions. So my first pick is Patrick Suskin's Perfume, The Story of a Murderer and I partially picked this because, like I said, so many of you have read this and loved it. Maybe it's a good excuse to reread it or read it if you've been meaning to for a long time but because it has such glowing reviews from you I wanted to pick it because hopefully that means um, lots of the rest of you will like it as well. Um, so that is Perfume but I also, like I said, wanted to pick something that I think fewer people have read, which is White is for Witching by Helen Ayami. You'll have heard me talk about both of those books in my October TBR, um, so I won't go into too much detail, but this one is about a murderer in 18th century Paris who is trying to distill the scent of a uh, innocent young virgin. He has this amazing uh, sense of smell. And this one is about kind of a haunted house on the cliffs near Dover, um, and it's about a girl who's sort of disappearing and acting strangely once she moves into this house um, and I'm very intrigued by it so those are my two book club picks for this month hope you will enjoy them with me but anyway let's move on to September's book club picks okay, we're going to start with a book that isn't on the long list because I picked two books for my um, book club and again one was more successful than the other I hope you read this one because it was really good and that was The Fire this time. I don't have it because I read it on my Kindle um, but it's a collection of essays and poems and it's edited by Jasmine Ward who you may recognise. Someone has begun knocking on the walls. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm really sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> it is non-stop. Um, she is an author. She writes mostly fiction I think apart from this book. She might have written some other non-fiction. Um, I have read one of her books, Sing Unburied Sing, that's what it's called. I've just tried closing the door just in case that eliminates a little bit of the noise. But anyway, um, I really enjoyed Sing Unburied Sing and I definitely want to read more from her. I love her prose style, it's really, really beautiful. Anywho, this is a collection of essays and poems edited by her. Um, I think she writes the introduction. They are about race and racism in America. Um, they're written by a wide range of acclaimed writers and I found it to be a really informative, if heart-rending collection. It kind of looks quite specifically at um, 
a few things that were happening in 2016 or had just happened. Um, so it's quite relevant to the time when it was published, but also at the same time, it is addressing more general issues and some of these events just seem to be happening over and over again. Um, instances of police brutality towards black citizens and um, yes, yeah, so it's still very relevant but it's also quite specific to 2016. So yes, the Charleston church shooting comes up, Ferguson's referenced multiple times as well and there's also an essay about Rachel Dolezal who you may remember um, from the time and there's just been instances recently of people who have done the same thing as Rachel Dolezal so Yes, like I said, very specific and also very relevant. So many of the essays are quite personal, written in the legacy of Baldwin, obviously. It's called The Fire this time. You know that I read The Fire next time not too long ago and really, really appreciated Baldwin's style. I think he really nails that um, informative but also personal and emotive style and as does Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, whose book I read last month. Um, and as do many of the authors in this work as well. So they're all kind of working um, within that sort of personal and memoirish on one side of things and also very analytical and theory based on the other and I really appreciate the marriage of the two things. Um, I think that it's a really great way for people to absorb non-fiction in a way that will engage them. Um, yeah, they're written. They're all written in really accomplished and engaging prose. I think Ward did a fantastic job of bringing, you know, the best of the best writers together for this collection. All of the essays were were really good. Some obviously noticeably better than others, but definitely a really great collection. I think of great writing. There are essays about police brutality, um, about how northern states in the U.S. kind of tend to cover up their history with the black population and with slavery. Um, sometimes literally by covering up old grave sites, um, which is what one essay talks about. Um, there's an essay about outcast and being black and southern and music, obviously. Um, there's an essay about Phyllis Wheatley Peters, who was an African-American woman who published a book of poetry in 1773. She was the first African-American woman to do so um, and she had been born into slavery and was freed just before she died, I think. Um, so I found that really interesting because I didn't know anything about her. There's essays about white rage, there's essays about walking while black. It covers an enormous range of topics. I think without being too overwhelming, without being too long, it's not a really, really long book. Um, so yes, if you are a reader that doesn't favour lengthier non-fiction or likes to have a personal aspect to your non-fiction, but you still want to get some of that analysis, you still want to learn, um, I definitely would recommend this. So. The second book that I picked for book club was Diane Cook's The New Wilderness, which was less of a success for me than The Fire This Time. I didn't dislike it as much as I disliked Redhead by the Side of the Road, which I picked last month um, for us all to read, which I apologise. Um, but yes, anyway, let's just get into it. You know I love a bit of nature writing. I just love books set in nature. It's just my cup of tea. I love it. Um, so I was very excited about the prospect of this dystopia, which is about a mother and daughter who venture into this new wilderness, the wilderness, um, from the city. They participate in a study. It seems like everyone is living in the city or in a city, um, and it's getting really smoggy there, it's getting, like, the conditions are getting bad, it's getting pretty apocalyptic. Yes, this mother and daughter choose to take part in the study to go and live in the wilderness. Um, they are required to be nomadic, so they have to keep moving so they don't sort of destroy the environment. Um, and yes, they have to live a sort of primitive existence, but it's not super intense. I thought it would kind of be more intense than it is. It's not super intense. So yeah, so the mother did not really want to leave the city and the comforts of the city, but her daughter was getting increasingly sick because of air pollution and other mysterious things. Um, so yeah, they join 18 other people to live off the land. And obviously as time goes on this begins to create tension between the two because Agnes, who's the daughter, is starting to lose her memories of the city and she's becoming wild. At the same time she's sort of growing into a teenager and coming of age 
in a totally different environment than her mother came of age. So it's creating all of this tension and it's widening this gap between them. It means there's a lot of miscommunication going on. Um, so the best thing about this book is that mother-daughter relationship. Um, it's wrought in all of its complexity and pain and um, confusion and yeah it's definitely the focus of this book and it's where it does its best work I think. Um, I enjoyed it sort of slow plodding through the wilderness. Um, I was engaged throughout, I wanted to keep reading but I know that for some people this is a bit of a drag um, and the majority of the book sort of feels plotless to a lot of people until the sort of final developments over the final few pages so I can see why people find this boring but for me I kind of enjoy the long treks and the sort of daily ins and outs of life in this nomadic existence. Naturally it's looking, I mean she wrote a book of short stories before called Man versus Nature so she's very much interested in our relationship with nature and obviously it is about that, it's about climate change, it's about our relentless destruction of the env our environment. But there was actually a lot less of this than I thought there was going to be beyond the sort of concept of this is the last wilderness and is it really a wilderness, is it more like a kind of weird theme park. So yes, beyond the sort of initial concept there isn't actually that much about that really. It's sort of, and I've seen people describe it as an eco-thriller, um, though it isn't that thrilling. You know sometimes they stumble across slightly weird and uncanny things um, but I don't think anyone that's used to thrillers would find it that thrilling um, but it's more focused really on the interpersonal relationships of the people within that um, group um, as they're trying to get along under difficult circumstances and of course you know leaders emerge and first they all want consensus they all agree on every decision and then yeah we get leaders and there's lots of tensions and that that makes up most of the drama of the book. It's something that I generally enjoy, so. Um, like I said, I was engaged throughout. However, it is not a flawless book by any means. So this book was worst, I would say, on its weird, uh, well, its lack of treatment of race or its overwhelming whiteness, really, um, despite having a Northern American setting. I'm not sure that this applies to every book written by a white author but in this case it felt like it really stood out to me um, for example yeah so it's got this kind of Northern American setting and something that made me just go oh is in the acknowledgement she says she visited real places and environments researched real traditions food ways and skills of tribal populations as well as of earlier primitive cultures looking for materials with which to build this fictional world okay and then she goes on in the next sentence to acknowledge um, various Native American tribes whose ancestral lands provided inspiration for where these characters lived and walked. So the, two, the juxtaposition of those two sentences made me feel uncomfortable for all sorts of different reasons which it would <laughs> take a long time to unpack. But um, the fact that there's that in the acknowledgements and then there's like no acknowledgement of that in the actual text. Um, I just thought it was odd. All the characters seem quite culturally similar, um, and basically culturally deficient. With the, but then there's the occasional use of Spanish thrown in. So I sort of get it that maybe she's trying to create this sense of homogenization, globalization. Everyone lives in the in this city. Everyone's lives are the same. But I think it needs more, especially if you're going to throw Spanish in. It just seems totally weird to me. Yes, I think it would have really elevated the book and made the book better um, and taken it beyond just a book looking at a group of people in a sort of wilderness, living a sort of nomadic existence at the same time being a part of a study. Like, I think it would have just pushed it. Um, I think it's possibly a failing of the world building, which there is not much of. Um, beyond the concept of city versus wilderness, which again, I don't usually mind too much. Um, some books just suit a light world building, but in this case, I think it brings up that problem of race. Like I said, it's kind of about those interpersonal relationships. It's about the mother-daughter relationship, and it kind of does a good job on those things, but it's quite long. If you don't like descriptions of treks through nature, 
I definitely think there's better dystopian writing out there. That would be a better use of your time. A weird one because I kind of enjoyed the process of reading it, but yes, kind of flawed in various large ways. So here's a book I really, really liked. Now we're on to other books. And um, this is, sorry, I'm just getting my notes ready. Um, this is Love and Other Thought Experiments by Sophie Ward. Um, and this book completely caught me off guard. Um, and it's probably still my favourite um, book on the long list so far that I've read. Um, haven't finished the long list, but yes, I think it's probably my favourite. It's not a perfect book, but I did, I did really like it. Yes, like I said, this book will go places you will never have guessed. I almost feel like I'm ruining it by saying that, um, because I went into it just having no idea what was going to happen, or that it was even going to go somewhere I didn't expect, and because I didn't expect what I didn't expect, I think it really worked. But I just got to tell you that yes, it certainly goes places. But also because of that, I obviously don't want to talk too much about the plot, um, or even its themes, um, or its genre, um, because I want to preserve that surprise for you um, as well, because it was fun. Um, I read it in one afternoon, and I really enjoyed it. I immersed myself in it, and it really did feel like a kind of roller coaster. So it starts with a couple, Rachel and Eliza, and they're debating whether to start a child, to start a child, start a family, and have a child. Um, Eliza's a bit more unsure, she kind of seems to have one foot out the door. Um, and she doesn't know whether she really wants this, and this is causing a tension between them, which is somehow tied to, compounded by, concurrent with, the fact that Rachel believes there are ants on her side of the bed, um, even when there's visibly no ants. Um, and then, even more worryingly, one night she begins to insist that one of these ants has crawled inside her eye and into her brain. Um, and she can feel it there. So. Eliza takes this leap of faith and she says to Rachel that she believes her, that she believes there's an ant inside her head um, against her better judgement because she's kind of a clear-headed, down-to-earth scientist type of character. Um, and this is a leap of trust which allows the two then to go on and have this baby. Which, I know the two things um, there sound like they don't make sense together, but... and and also that they kind of do, and I think that's kind of the point. You know, this is contemporary literary fiction. It's going to sometimes be a little bit out there. Um, so I was worried in this first chapter that this book was not going to be for me. I didn't know, really, what was going to happen. I enjoy a little bit of the absurd, um, but sometimes you have contemporary literature and literary fiction. It kind of starts a little bit like this, and then it sort of goes nowhere, um, and it continues to sort of not have a point. Um, but I was very, very wrong, and it definitely went somewhere, as I said. <laughs> so following this, there are ten chapters, some of which are definitely connected to this first story, like obviously so, and some of which seem like standalone stories, but I don't think I'm spoiling too much to say that they are actually connected. Um, and each one is prefaced by a famous thought experiment from the philosophy of mind, and um, we've got, for example, um, Pascal's wager about... The existence of God. What else have we got in here? We've got the prisoner's dilemma about who's going to sell out who. Got uh, David Chalmers's philosophical zombie. Just all sorts, from all sorts of bits of history. The Chinese room. That's a real classic about artificial intelligence. Anyway, so lots and lots of thought experiments. I definitely think this book is a little bit messy. Um, it takes you on a rollicking journey through all of these thought experiments. Um, especially as we approach the final few chapters, it sort of explodes. Um, and its execution isn't perfect. I don't think all of its narrative points and themes were always explored or connected quite as successfully as they might have been. But I very much admired Ward's ambition, her scope of vision, um, and her really unique approach in this book. And it's always nice to read a book that you don't feel like you've read a hundred times before. Um, I actually think if this book had been longer and more detailed and more smoothly joined together that it might not have worked so well because it would have taken itself too seriously it would have been too intense this book's got a real sense of fun as well as being quite touching and moving 
and being about human nature and being about loss and being about all these big thought experiments. Um, I would recommend it if you like ambitious books that require a little bit of attention and they also require healthy suspension of disbelief. Everything doesn't have to knit together perfectly for you. And if you like more than a little bit of philosophy and you just want something that will surprise you, I think I would definitely recommend this. However, I don't think it's gonna be for everyone. Um, because I don't think everyone will sort of like where it goes, especially in such a short page count. I mean, it's, I say short page count, it's still like 250 pages, so it's kind of like average novel size, but you know what I mean, um, when a book's dealing with so much, often they're much longer. But yes, I think it'll be too messy for some people, I don't think everyone will like where it goes, but if it sounds like it will suit you, then I would definitely recommend it. Okay, let's talk about Sugar Bane. Um, by Douglas Stewart. This one's been shortlisted, along with The New Wilderness, actually, I didn't say that, did I? I'm getting very dark in here, my friends, because I started filming this quite late in the day, so you'll have to forgive me. Anyway, so this book follows Hugh Shuggy Bain. Um, he's growing up in 1980s Glasgow. And obviously, as I'm sure many of you all know, at that time, large swathes of Glasgow's population were sort of devastated by Thatcherism and the closure of the mines. Um, meaning that many families were experiencing poverty and there's a whole generation of men that are just out of work and obviously this caused all sorts of social problems as well. Um, for Shuggy, this means that his mother, abandoned by his father, who's this sort of hyper-masculine dickhead basically, um, she becomes an alcoholic. She begins to get deeper and deeper into her addiction. Her addiction. Um, his older brother and sister sort of do their best to escape and find better lives for themselves but as the youngest child Shuggy finds himself unable to leave his mother and kind of unwilling to because he is the last remaining child but also at the same time he's unable to really care for her because addiction is addiction. This has made all the more difficult for him because he finds himself being bullied by his peers for being effeminate and for being gay and this is a world where masculinity, even if it's toxic, provides you with a vital layer of prote protection so he is made even more vulnerable um, basically by that. So I found this book really slow to start and I wondered whether I would ever get into it at all um, but eventually I was pulled into Shuggy's story. Um, it's semi-autobiographical and it was written over 10 years and you can kind of tell. It felt a little bit overlong, it felt very personal, but it felt like it could have been edited a little more. It does become repetitive because whilst I know that is the nature of alcoholism, um, nonetheless I still think it needed a little bit of trimming because I think you can still achieve that narrative effect with less. Um, so the prose style is quite straightforward and unfussy, which I liked and that really let the story and the characters shine through. Um, so compared to other books on the list, this one is fairly straightforward, as is The New Wilderness, really. I was sometimes concerned with the book's portrayal of women. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but something was happening there, which was making me a bit uncomfortable. Um, and also its portrayal of addiction. Perhaps it'd be better to say that this book is certainly focused on Shuggy's observations of his mother and the behavioural aspects of addiction. Um, and its impact, its devastating impact on the people around um, the addict, but not so much on the nature of addiction or on the experience of, I think it's Agnes as the mother. So yeah, if you're going into expecting that, that isn't really in here, it's very much focused on Shuggy's perspective. So overall, I thought this was an accomplished debut. Um, I'd be intrigued to see what Stuart writes next, um, because it felt like this book was definitely an exercise in catharsis which is absolutely understandable um, but yes I wonder what else he has up his sleeve um, I don't think I would go out of my way to recommend this book um, because I do think there are other books that treat with lots of these issues a little bit less unevenly um, and a bit more succinctly also big trigger warning on this one for sexual assault for abuse um, and it also it is a heavy, heavy read, so make sure you are aware of that before going in, because yes, it's a lot. I'm really sorry for the light, everyone. I forgot that we're heading into autumn winter now and that I cannot rely on light late in the day. Anywho, okay, on to a completely different book. This is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid. So, this is a book which really surprised me, because... I sort of thought I would hate it <laughs> um, and I had seen a fair amount of mixed reviews from it and I went into it with quite low expectations 
Now, again, sort of like with Love and Other Thought Experiments, I think by, me by merely saying that may ruin it for you because um, I think going into it with low expectations was actually very beneficial to my reading of it. Um, and I'm about to say some nice things about it. Part of the reason I thought I would dislike this book is because I generally try to avoid books that are about bloggers and social media because something about it just makes me feel like, oh, I don't know, weird. <laughs> um, obviously it is my job, so um, that makes me feel a bit weird, but I don't know whether that's the case for everyone, like probably lawyers like reading books about lawyers. I don't know. Um, or maybe they hate it because everyone gets everything wrong. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, I think the problem with writing books that are set pretty much right now, or maybe two or three years ago, is because you have to get it so right. Um, the dialogue, the authentic sort of text speak, um, an authentic social media speak, the real way you use technology and not just the way that would most aid the plot and the writing choices of the author. Um, and these were things that Anne Tyler really fell down on in Redhead by the Side of the Road, especially by making the main character's job um, a tech job. But anyway, so more often than not, it all ends up sounding to me really contrived. Um, however, I think this book mostly hits the mark um, and avoids being too cringy. Um, I feel like some people will still find parts of it cringy, and it is sometimes, but I think it mostly gets it right, um, and it doesn't distract too much from the content of the book. So it follows Amira, who is a black sitter, she's working for a white family, and the mother, Alex, is a sort of semi-famous feminist blogger and mother, and she's like renowned for breastfeeding her baby in the middle of a panel talk, for example. Um, and she's supposed to be writing her first book, which is why she um, hires Amira. So one night she calls Amira late at night to look after her daughter because there's been a bit of an emergency at home. So Amira and the daughter go to the grocery store um, to waste some time. And while she's there, Amira is questioned by security and accused of kidnapping the child. So. This triggers a sort of insecurity bomb in Alex. She is one of the most insecure characters I've read in a long time. And it sets in motion this weird, odd series of events which shows just how harmful the actions of even well-meaning white people can be, as well as how they can be blatantly self-serving and performative, even when doing the right thing, um, or also when doing the wrong thing. Neither Alex nor Amira's white boyfriend, Kelly, who has a whole host of issues of his own, um, are portrayed as downright evil. Uh, and both sometimes, sometimes, make somewhat astute points or attempts to help Amira. But they also try to wield Amira's proximity to them and her blackness for their own benefit. Um, and I think it's a book which will hopefully and quite deservedly embarrass a lot of white people who may recognise themselves in its pages. Um, and I think it quite brilliantly captures a lot of the pitfalls of contemporary conversations about race and how they play out both in day-to-day -day life and online. So there's actually a lot of layers in this book, more than I was expecting. I was expecting it to be a little bit more, um, what's the word, formulaic, but actually there was a lot of sort of different things going on here which I really appreciated. Um, Reed's writing is both light and accessible as well as being sharp and incisive and satiric. And yeah, it's not the heavy literary fiction hitter that you expect from the book a long list. Um, it's definitely, you know, marketed, you can tell from the cover, as being a little bit more accessible. But I definitely think it deserves its place on the list for really deftly merging difficult conversations with an engaging plot and an eminently readable writing style. And it's almost, not thriller-esque, but it's it, it gallops along um, and sort of there's twists and turns and things happen. So I really appreciated it a lot more than I thought I was going to. And um, yes, but you have to sort of take it as it is. But I, I liked it and I will definitely be reading whatever she publishes next. On to two books that I am confused about. Not that they are bad books by any means, but I am just confused. So, um, first up we've got The Book of Not by Tsitsi Dangaremga. Yes, so this is a book that was well executed, that achieved everything it set out to do, 
um, but nonetheless I couldn't help but find it just a bit of a slog to get through. However, I do think it's worth reading and I do still really like Tsitsi Dangromga. So, this is obviously a trilogy in, well, not obviously, if you didn't know, you didn't know. <laughs> um, so, starts with Nervous Conditions, that was published in 1989. This book was published in 2006, I believe, yep. And um, the most recent book, This Morning Will Body, was published this year and has been nominated and subsequently shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Um, so I read Nervous Conditions quite a few years ago now, but I have read it um, and I thought it was important to read this one before I move on to This Morning Will Body. Um, which I've heard is the right thing to do. I think it makes sense. But yes, my memory of Nervous Conditions is somewhat hazy, but I still feel like, in the sort of back of my mind, my mind is telling me that this book felt markedly different from um, the first book. And I felt like it kind of lacked a little bit of that book's energy and pacing. Um, so I'm very intrigued um, to see whether the final instalment will be different again, um, now that it's been another... 14 years since this was published. I sort of think the monotony was not unintentional here and it sort of serves a purpose. So the book mostly follows our protagonist Tambu or Tambudzai. Um, she's at a prestigious school to which she's won a scholarship um, and basically black students are required at this school um, also by um, Zimbabwean quotas or Rhodesian quotas at the time. So yes, she's hoping for a brighter, more educated future. That's all she wanted in Nervous Conditions was to be educated um, and to leave her village basically. Um, and she wants that bright future despite the fact that Zimbabwe at the time of this book is in the middle of a war for independence and a pretty brutal one at that. The novel opens with this explosive scene um, whereby Tambu, she's on leave from school, she's been asked to be at this meeting in her village and she witnesses her sister's leg get blown off in front of her. But kind of like with the death of her brother in nervous conditions, she feels disconnected from the scene. She's kind of unable to care. Her only hope is that this information doesn't get back to the white nuns and the students at the young ladies college of the Sacred Heart. So throughout a large part of the book, Tambu obsessively worries about school and her education. Um, despite being one of the top performing students, she's passed over for this um, yearly prize for best results in favour of the closest white competitor. She finds herself unable to find her place either amongst the white students but also um, amongst the black students because with the latter she's quite disdainful of them, she wants to distance herself from them. Um, and basically the spirit of colonialism has fully invaded Tambu's mind, sort of like a virus. And it shows just how difficult and complicated colonialism can get and how much it kind of psychologically destroys a culture. Um, because on the one hand, you sort of understand why Tambu wants to get herself an education and leave her village and her mother who acts pretty poorly towards her um, and everything that is expected of her as a woman there. But on the other hand, this education really divorces Tambu from her culture, from her people and from a sense of womanhood that isn't defined by the coloniser. So it's such a tricky, sticky thing that just shows how damaging colonialism is basically on so many levels, including just on the psychology of this one girl. Beyond that, alongside Tambu, we are, as readers are turning our faces from the day-to-day -day violence and action of Zimbabwe's war for independence. Um, and instead, by concentrating on Tambu and the goings on at her school, again, we're seeing how colonialism and the war have far-reaching psychological effects. So, from my limited perspective, obviously I could never understand um, what Tambu is going through here, but it feels like this novel does an excellent job of showing the sheer amount of daily paranoia, thought and effort that went into being black in a white institution like Sacred Heart at the time, um, when students were not allowed to touch across race lines, you know, even accidentally, um, they all have to line up in a single file and you know this is a big thing for the black students at the school because if one of the girls steps backward into them they're not allowed to touch so you know you have to choose which white girl to stand behind someone that's less likely to um, be overly offended if you accidentally do touch etc etc so it's very detailed on all of that thought process that goes into um, 
living in this school as a black student. Um, they had separate toilets, which is an impossible situation when, you know, nature calls or it's really urgent. Um, they have to outperform everyone else. However, obviously, all of this, as well as Tambu's behaviour towards her peers, makes her quite unlikable. And it ultimately, you know, once it starts to get a little bit repetitive, it makes fairly um, mundane reading, even if it's totally understandable, intentional, and it serves a purpose. So also the pacing of this novel is kind of weird. Um, we can spend pages and pages and pages on one dinner, one dinner at the school, and the minutiae of the dialogue and all the different tensions and things that are going on. Um, but then suddenly Tambu was out of school and in various jobs and then independence arrives kind of randomly and that sort of all comes in the last few sections of the book. Again, I feel like Nervous Conditions, from what I can remember, um, had a bit more control and focus on some of these um, narrative elements than this instalment. But yes, yeah, so the in-betweenness of Tambu means that she ends up on a kind of lonely road by the end of the book. Kind of unable to successfully integrate and become a new Zimbabwean as a black woman who is highly educated through a colonial system um, and it's, but it's now a system that is changing to neo-colonialism through capitalism and globalisation. So I'm very interested as to where Dangaram go goes next in the series and whether we will see any hope return in Tambu's future. I'm not, I'm not massively hopeful myself. Um, but yes, like, as you can see, because I've done a lot of talking about it, um, this novel works through lots and lots of complex ideas about colonialism and all sorts of other things and womanhood and the intersection of the two. But it is nonetheless a pretty slow read. So I'm glad I read it. I will read anything else she ever publishes. Um, but I do think it probably won't massively appeal to loads and loads of readers if some of those elements really matter to you. Final book is The Shadow King. I talked a little bit about this on Instagram because I was really struggling with this one. So yes, I almost put this book down at about 80 pages because I was struggling with the prose style so, so much. Um, but I'm glad I ended up pushing through because I think I came to appreciate this book for what it was rather than what I wanted it to be or what I would have preferred as a reader. So it's about the 1935 Italian invasion of Ethiopia. It was specifically um, inspired by Marza Mengiste's um, discovery that her great-grandmother, um, I think it was her great-grandmother, yes, um, fought in that war. So, that, so she discovered basically that women fought in that war. So we start off with three characters. We've got Kidane and his wife Asta and their maid Harut. Um, she's kind of a maid, it's sort of a jack of all trades. Um, so at first there's lots of tension and conflict between Aster and Harut, mostly sort of regarding Kidane um, and sort of power struggle there, with Kidane often coming to the rescue of Harut um, to the chagrin of his wife. However, the Italians invade and Kidane becomes an important leader within the Ethiop Ethiopian army and he goes off to war and basically Aster and Harut eventually find common ground and we also see how misogynist Kadane is as well and he sort of has a fall from grace as well because he does some terrible terrible things and yes at first the women are sort of supposed to be following this army around with you know doing the cooking tending to the wounded um, but Astra and Harut manage to make themselves a part of the sort of soldier force as well. So I actually think the relationship between Astra and Harut was underrepresented and it got lost somewhere um, as the cast of characters became bigger and the storyline became bigger um, and I would have actually liked to see more of them in their development. I wish this novel for me had had a little bit more focus on sort of a singular plot line rather than jumping around as much as it did. Um, I think that can work but in this case it felt a bit chaotic alongside all of the other elements. Um, also an important character is the Jewish Italian soldier Ettore, um, who's a photographer, um, so he's taking pictures of the Italian invasion. So obviously at first he's sort of supportive of the invasion, he is there, whether or not he's super active or not, um, but then he begins to hear reports of anti-Semitism at home and he starts to see the humanity of the people whose country he is invading. Um, 
so as I said my main struggle with this book was with its prose for me it was just it just felt florid and too overwrought um, I don't love using words like that because I know some people really really like flowery prose but for me it's too much or it needs to be um, used a little bit more sparingly like you can have those moments but not too many so every single moment I felt particularly towards the beginning was described in this really dramatic way which for me generally undermines those moments which are actually really pivotal and noteworthy um, I'm definitely a less is more kind of reader in that respect um, it felt like Mengiste was really manufacturing an atmosphere and it felt contrived in the first hundred pages or so without allowing it to come naturally from the really engaging narrative concept um, or a few more sort of carefully chosen descriptive passages. Um, and in lots of ways, for me, I think these things really obscured the plot and some of the more beautiful, almost cinematic moments that she created. Um, there were some real beautiful moments in here, but there were just, there was so much going on that they were lost, they got lost for me because yeah, there's also a lot of style, other stylistic things going on. There's Greek elements because there's a chorus and there's interludes. Um, and I think a Greek philosopher <laughs> makes his way in somehow. Um, and then there's descriptions of various photos taken by Torre. So there's like these little chapters that are inserted of like a description of a photo. There's this huge cast. There's this inclusion of huge historical figures like Haile Selassie. There's a framing narrative which by the end seems sort of unimportant to me. There is so much um, in here, like so much, that it just, yeah, like I said, for me, really obscured the plot and some of the things I was most interested in, like Harut and Asta, for example, because in addition, there was a lot less of the women than I thought there would be. And after the first sections dedicated to Harut, Asta and Kadane, they were mostly seen through the male gaze, which I was like, this is odd and seemed like a kind of missed opportunity. And there were some, to my mind, gratuitous scenes of sexual assault, big trigger warning on this book, because that happens again and again. Um, I know it's part of the war, I know it's part of this world that the women are in, but I think it needs to be handled carefully. Um, and it just seemed gratuitous at times to me. But yes, like I said, I kept seeing these flashes of real beauty in the writing here, um, and also in her chosen themes, and also in her storyline, and she's certainly an accomplished writer in lots of ways, but I just wish, for me as a reader, she dialed back some of those other elements so that those moments could really have shined more. Um, that is just me as a reader, that's what I prefer and many people absolutely love this book and many people really sort of like slightly more flowery prose and actually it's the thing they look for the most in a book and everything else comes second. If that's something that you like in a book, 100% I would recommend it but if you're more like me um, I think it's probably one to give, a, to give a miss but I am really glad I read it because I do think it's quite a unique book in lots of ways. I am interested definitely to see what she writes next but I will possibly be a little bit more wary next time. So that is everything for this month. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed this video and I will be back soon on your screens with a little Vlogtober vlog. Um, shouldn't be too long. I'm not doing daily vlogs this year but I think that will be the next thing that you see from me. So yes, but thank you so much for watching today and I will see you again very soon. Bye.